Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dumbrel Podcast. I'm here with a good friend of mine, Eric, and today we're going to be trying something a little bit different. Well, we're going to be enjoying a glass of wine, which maybe is not that unusual, but I'm going to be introducing a QR code just in case you want to enjoy the same wine that we have. And I'm going to play around with an idea uh, to make this podcast format a little bit more sustainable. And so for now, it's only going to be working for people who are in mainland China. Um, I know there's a lot of people who follow me on YouTube and the podcast side. Um, but whatever, we'll try it out first and see how it goes. If you're watching it on YouTube, obviously you'll see the QR code, which you can scan. If you're listening to it on the podcast format, we'll, we'll leave a link in the description. But uh, before, I guess before we start chatting, let's have a sip of this wine first of all. Cheers. Oh, that's nice. Uh, let's let's uh, introduce the wine in a second, but um, <laughs> after we introduce you, I think that's a little bit more important. But um, while Eric's taking a sip, I'll just uh, quickly mention, uh, we met each other at my brew pub, and it's quite an interesting story because uh, we found out that we were neighbors in Canada, pretty much, and now we are neighbors again yes. over here. Yes. But um, before I say too much, uh, how about you introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, yeah, a little bit about your background. Um, pretty much born and raised in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you, you missed something. Oh, what's that? Well, you, you lived in England before. Oh, that's right. You, you were there too, weren't you? Yeah. Um, pretty much in the same area. Oh, or in the uh, East End. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. So three times neighbor. We just keep <laughs> following each other. And we were living in the same garden here, the same uh, building complex. <laughs> yes. And where I'm sure wherever one of us goes next, we're probably going to end up in the same spot again. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, um, you were in Hong Kong until uh, what age? Um, my early teenage. Yeah. Yeah. Then I, I, I lived in Canada. Mm -hmm. I would say that I went to school in Canada. I wouldn't say I studied there. You're, yeah. you're, what I you went were, to school there, yeah. but I wouldn't say I studied. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see, I see. And then, and then afterwards back over to... Yeah, the, back to Hong Kong. And then I moved around, like, you know, I was in Malaysia. I was in Malaysia, like, you know, back to mainland China. And I was like, you know, traveling pretty much to uh, Taiwan and Japan for a bit. So now you're settled here in, uh, in China on the mainland side. But most of your experiences in Hong Kong, I guess, growing up was under a kind of British rule. It was while the British were still... Colonial days. Yeah, the colonial days. Yeah. So that must have been um, interesting. And we'll get into a little bit about some of those differences um, with uh, perhaps what, what... Or just some of your experiences from back then. But um, maybe before we continue, let's try this. This is a new thing. And uh, we'll, we'll try to introduce... What are we drinking right now, first of all? Uh, we're drinking a wine from, um, from a very famous winemaker. You know, well, Hollywood actually made a film on him. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, a few years back there, like, you know, starring Russell Crowe. Okay, the name of the movie was um, A Good Year. Okay, this winemaker is called Hugh Raymond. In the, uh, in the industry, in the, wine, in, the, in the wine business, in the wine business, in, in the wine world. Well, he's known to be the flying winemaker. And um, yeah, I mean, th this is you're doing. A, uh, this is your kind of main business now, and you're traveling yeah. over to France a lot. I mean, yes. You're working with some really good estates and things like that. Yes. And um, so this is one of them that you've gone over and you've kind yes. of uh, sourced. Yeah. Yes, it's organic. Oh wow! Okay, it's organic, and uh, this estate, like you know, the the chateau, was owned by the uh, Henry the Fourth, the oh. king. Oh really? Yeah, his hunting house. Oh, okay. Where he kept. Where he kept his mistress. Oh, okay, okay, hidden away over there. Yeah. And so, he, were, were, they house. were they making wine back then at that time also, or not quite yet? I think so. Well, yeah. I mean, how could you not have wine also? Uh, <laughs> right away. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. It's very nice. It's very, uh, yeah. It's very good. It's old vin, forty four year old vin. Mm. Mm. Old wine, old wine. Forty four years. No, old. forty year, forty, 40 year, year old. old. Wow. Wow. That's. Um, so now moving from this topic of wine, which we'll get back to in a minute, which is more about your kind of current life, I'm a little bit more interested to find out about what life was like in Hong Kong, because obviously you grew up during kind of the colonial days um, and just, you know, how it was different then from now um, or, you know, are there certain things? I, I guess there's a lot of people that don't really get involved in politics at all and these kinds of things don't matter. So you get these debates that you always see about the fact that Hong Kong was a lot less free under the British and all of this kind of stuff. But I think for the ordinary person, it doesn't matter. So I just want to know from your general experience, 
what it was like growing up in Hong Kong. What were your experiences like? Were there things uh, uh, better then or worse than than it is now? Or just generally, what was it like growing up in Hong Kong? Uh, well, all I can say, all I can say, it was different. Different, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty much different from now. It was much more of a smaller town. It, it was a smaller town. Mm -hmm. Oh, sh should I say, like, you know, it was a small town. Yeah. Uh, compared yeah. to now, uh, uh, I compared guess. Compared to now, less crowded. And uh, in the old days, in the old days, like, you know, what we, we call the MTR crowded when you don't have a seat. <laughs> just you know, like we, 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 call, we, call, we call it crowded when you didn't have a seat. But now, but now, like, you know, you cannot get into the compartment. Like, you know, field times, <laughs> yeah. lining up without getting, getting into the compartment. It was a lot, a lot less busy in right. the old days. How was the breakup between like, um, like was it, is it way more common to see foreigners in Hong Kong now than it was then or is it more or less the same or there's no real... I think, I think there are more foreigners now. More now. More now than, than in the old days. Right. And I think, I think it, it is more metropolitan mm -hmm. now than, than before. Because in those days, like, you know, the foreigners we saw was mostly British. Um, and uh, what about what about people from mainland? Was there really few? I guess you had a, a flow of uh, migrants, you know, coming from mainland uh, throughout the times, but um, obviously nothing, probably nothing on the scale um, that you have now. It was w no, uh, we didn't have any any mainland tourist, right? Not 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 any mainland tourist. Well, for sure during that and then time. not too many mainland tourist. Yeah. Okay, but we've always had. You know, migrants from from mainland China. Would would it be really rare to hear Putonghua Mandarin uh, Chinese being spoken uh, in the streets, or would you encounter it sometimes? Um, no, not in the old days. Right. You know, the Mandarins we we heard were mostly like you know from Taiwan. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, I remember like in uh, in two thousand and seven when I was uh, I was attending the Global Sources Trade Fair. Uh, I had a booth there for my company. And one of my staff was from mainland. Um, she was uh, from Hunan. And when she said that when she was in the subways, um, particularly uh, even a few years before that, so we're talking like um, 2005, 2004, if she was speaking Mandarin in like the subways, people would look and be like, even then it wasn't as common as it is now. And that's pretty late. That's pretty late in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of like uh, rule of law or... Yeah, we're not going to get too much into politics, but we're, we're, the governance was there. Kind of, did you notice any difference, a corruption, or anything like that? No, I would say, like you know, even the colonial days, like you know, you, you, you can you can tell the difference between like they, there were two worlds before and after the setting up of the ICAC. Okay. Now uh, the ICAC um, for the anti-corruption department that was that did you, are you, do you know if that was was that set up under the British or was it uh, post uh, handover? Are you not sure? No, no, before before okay, before, before the hangover, like, you know, set, set up set it up by the uh, set up by the by the British. Every day, I, I remember you telling me before over drinks. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was you. I, I, I'm you know Thomas tells me a lot of really interesting stories about growing up in Hong Kong also. Uh, but there was a story of a, a postman uh, inside. Yeah. Was that you? Yeah, that was me. Okay, so how about you tell? Because that's an interesting story. Yeah, before the setting up, uh, you know, I remember as a kid, mm -hmm. as a kid, like you know, I was about like you know, five year old or, or, yeah, I think I think five, five, four to five year old. Like you know, well, I I remember my mother was cooking, was cooking in the um in in the kitchen. You know, the postman rang rang the bell, right, and, you know, knock on the door, like you know, trying to deliver trying to deliver a, a registered letter to us. So my mother, you know, I, I got the letter. Mm. I got the letter. You know, I, I tried to put something on, on the receipt. Okay, the, the postman went away. But my mother had to stop cooking and ran down the staircase. Okay, after, after the, the, the postman tried to give him five dollars, five Hong Kong dollars. That, that was a good job amount of money back yeah, then. The, yeah. yeah, yes, yes. It, it, so if, if you... Five dollars. If you hadn't given him uh, that five dollars, he maybe would not have delivered your mail in the future. No. So everything was kind of, you had to pay people off, even to... to no, so uh, postal workers are obviously government um, workers. That's really interesting. No, postman, the postman, uh, even the, the, the IE 
in a hospital like you know well if, if you wanted to to have any any you know hot water you would have to you would have to pay that's that, that that was before the um the, the the setting up of the icac wow that's interesting and and so across all uh, bodies uh, you had this kind of um wow this kind of an action but that that was hong kong yeah and then, so uh, growing up in school, you, when you went to school, uh, you were, I, I, guess, I guess you were uh, being taught in Cantonese uh, during that time, or was it English during the British? Both. Both, you're still doing both, yeah, okay. Yeah, both. No, actually, like, you know, the, 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 you know, the colonial days were also divided into t- different, different periods. Mm. Different periods. Uh, you know, my, you know, in my, in my experience, in my experience, my, you know, growing up, it was divided into two parts of the colonial days. Okay, the first part was like, you know, the corruption before the, you know, the anti-corruption agency was set up. Right. Okay, and after, and after that, after the setup, like, you know, Hong Kong became so clean. <laughs> really? Hong Kong became so clean, like, you know, no corruption whatsoever. It happened just really quickly after it was all set up. Yeah. That's, there must have been a lot of disappointed people who were making a lot of <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, 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 was, that was a surprise, like, you know, that period was, was a surprise. Yeah, a, a sudden change. A sudden change. I mean, for the ordinary person, that must have been such a relief. But, you know, b- b- before the British left, um, they, they sold a lot of land and a lot of property to some of the, you know, the four or five major uh, developers. Oh, yeah. it, it almost seems like they never really uh, handed Hong Kong back to China, but they sold it to private enterprise. Uh, because in, in Hong Kong now, you have basically um, just a handful of companies that own the, the pharmacies and the... Um, utility companies and the you know the big pro- obviously the property development projects um, was it a little bit more diverse beforehand or it was always kind of that way where the, it was kind of you know power was concentrated in the hands of just a few yeah they sold they sold land to the families who who built who built apartments and sold to these guys like you know the Chinese government was also very smart you know during the hangover period like you know they they they, they had rules about selling the land. They came in, right? That's like, like a thir- uh, how many 30 acres per year, or I can't remember what it yeah, was. They put yeah. the limits in place, didn't they? Yeah. I, I think they saw that that was going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, so that was a good thing that they did that. But it's still, it, 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 the, the power is quite concentrated in you know, the, 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 the income, the income of selling the land, the, you know, the revenue generated from selling the land was limited. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, right. Well, let's, let's not forget to have a little bit of a drink, too. So. <laughs> I'm going a little bit faster than you. <laughs> One of the other things I'm really curious about is um, kind of uh, approaching handover. You know, you, uh, the thing that, that really struck me about you was you're very proud of China. You're proud to say that you're Chinese. You have more people now that are kind of, you know, um, saying, oh, we're, we're, we're not British, we're not Chinese, we're Hong Kongers, as, you know, the famous kind of, well, I don't know if she's famous or not, but Denise Ho, the pop star, says, um, which obviously is a little bit funny because before she was um, kind of uh, rejected from China, <laughs> she used to say, we are Chinese and, and, and wave Chinese flags. And now she says, no, we're Hong Kongers. And um, that's a topic. We're not going to get too much into that. But I, I just it's somebody who um, really has annoyed me quite a lot over the days because she gets up on stage and she says, you know, the, 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 the democratic systems that have been put in place for over a century in Hong Kong are eroding under the Chinese. What, what, what a century of democratic systems? No. But um, on to the main point, um, you not only are you, um, you know, proud of saying you're Chinese now, um, from the stories that you've told me, you were always uh, proud of being Chinese, even before handover, even approaching handover. Um, whereas I would have thought, especially kind of potentially with the, the circle of friends that you had, there were probably a lot of people that were the opposite or that were worried um, as ni- uh, 1997 was approaching. W- w- what made you different? Like, why were you always kind of confident or proud or w- what was it that made you different in that regard? I trust a mirror. <laughs> you trust a mirror. <laughs> you tell me you're, Ch- you're Chinese. <laughs> well, I mean, there must have been, there must be more me. You know, so my friend, uh, my other friend, I, I, I really like his story. Because um, he, he went as far as talking about how um, his grandfather suffered in China. 
he, he so he his um, grandfather went to build the uh, railroads in, in in California, which was pretty much slave labor. Like they mm-hmm. gave a bit of money mm-hmm. to the, the, to his family, and then he went over. And then after he did that, he spent thirty years um, working in some sort of a little supermarket, uh, earning a little bit of money. After he earned enough money, he came back to Guangdong, uh, to Meizhou, to their hometown, and uh, bought a little bit of land. You know, now he was you know pretty wealthy. And then the Cultural Revolution happened. And you know what happens to landowners when the Cultural Revolution happens. So he escaped with whatever he could grab in his hands to Hong Kong. And so his grandfather hates China. He, he, he absolutely hates it. You know, so later on, China uh, actually offered, uh, they had a program to uh, return the land to people who uh, lost their land during that time. But he thought it was a trap. He's like, no, no, I'm not going back. It turned out it was actually real, but whatever. He uh, really doesn't like China. And he's staying in Hong Kong. So as his grandson, you would think that he would also kind of follow in step. So I asked him the question, the same thing. I said, why are you different? Why do you uh, defend China so much? And he said, because he knows China. He had the opportunity to come to China. And he saw how see. quickly it was yeah. changing. And so um, during those kind of stages in the early kind of days of, of, of uh, you know, before handover, were you making trips over to China? Were you seeing mm-hmm. what was going on? Yeah. What, what was your experience that kind of shaped your image of, of China? Backward. Then. Then was your, your impression. Yeah, it was pretty backward. And uh, I remember coming over to, um, to, to Shenzhen. You know, well, I went to this movie in, uh, in, in Shenzhen, Laojie. Dongmen. Mm, mm. Dongmen. Yeah, in Lohu, yeah. I couldn't walk afterward. What, what, why? Because, like, you know, uh, my, 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 my legs were all covered by, by mosquito bites. Oh, wow. Yeah, I guess it was really different. What, what, my, uh, uh, my friend I'm talking about, he said when he had to go back to Meizhou, uh, uh, or I, I think that's where it was in Guangdong, it was like a two or three day trip. It's like you had to cross multiple rivers and you had to, like now you just drive whatever, a couple hours, or, but it was a two or three day trip. But he said back then time didn't cost anything. So whatever, it doesn't matter. But I guess um, the infrastructure was probably just non-existent back then. Did you have the, you had the train though? You had the train from uh, Hong Kong to, uh, that was pretty early, right? Yeah. And um, I remember the first time I came back, the first time I came back to China later you know, with my father, my sister. We had to leave early. We had to leave quite early. Wake up to wake up so early in the morning, like you know, what, three o'clock in the morning, to get to Chim Sa Choi. You know, the train station was then. You know, the terminal was in Chim Sa Choi. Oh, it wasn't in Hong Kong at that time. No, no, the, the train station. So you go to TST. Uh, you get on the train. Chim Sa Choi, like you, where you see the tower now. You know, nearby the the staff area. That's that's the tower with the uh, with the with the clock on. Oh, okay, 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 yeah. Okay, that that was part. That was part of the Chim Sa Choi, you know, uh, train terminal. Where would it ta- take you from from to Shenzhen? Uh, okay, so so that one did cross the border. It, no, to 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 Lohu. Oh, Lo, okay, to Lohu. Lohu. Lohu, and then you'd uh... you, you you have to walk, you have to walk, like you know, walk across the border. Were there were there multiple trains per day, or it, it was um, as far as you remember? I I don't know if they were like you know multiple train back then. Because like you know what, there were, f- I think four, four, four guys crossing the border from Hong Kong to mainland. Oh, just like uh, usually, just a, a handful of people. No, there, 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 there were, there were four on that day. Okay, <laughs> me, my father, and my sister. No, nobody else was crossing into China. Another guy. Okay, there, there were four. I said there were four. Okay, me, my father. And my sister, they were well. We were three. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was a really odd thing to hear about people going from Hong Kong to China during those uh, days. Yeah. What What were you doing? Why were you going to to China? No, we had some family business. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, some family family things to 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 dissolve. Right. Right. Yeah. So we we crossed the border. We crossed the border. I remember arriving Guangzhou at night. Yeah, in the evening. What was the border crossing like? So you still had to go through Hong Kong exit customs or at yeah. that time? Okay, so Hong Kong exit customs. I don't remember exactly okay. you know, exiting Hong Kong, but I, I remember entering, entering Shenzhen. So what was that like? Very different. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just... Another world. 
another world. Another world. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw uniform, uniform soldiers, like, you know, Jie Fang Jun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was searching me as well. Like, you know, I was searching me as, 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 as a boy. Searching to see what you're bringing in and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and searching, you know, from, yeah, checking my, checking, checking everything. Wow, it must, it must really have been like walking into another world. Uh, yeah, it was, it was like, you know, it took the whole day, the whole day to get to Guangzhou. <laughs> so after you cross the border, what, what's the process to get to Guangzhou from there? It's um, buses or what, what do you do from there? Was there, do you remember? Was there a, tr there was, there was a train or? A train, I think. Okay, I, I think, okay. I think. But just not very quick. Uh, no, that I don't remember because mm. like, you know, it was about, three to four right but I, I remember quite well you know the scene is still still there the picture is still there like you know when i cross the border i'm being being searched yeah being searched and uh check my belongings that that yeah by that, uniform that, by uniform personnel that must have been yeah that must have been a real adventure as a as a kid now so, so Guangzhou back then was Guangzhou still pretty because I, mean, I think Guangzhou uh, fairly early on comparatively speaking to other cities in China was a fairly prosperous but during that time was it still um, really not very developed at all no very uh, it was like you know at 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 night it was total darkness. <laughs> that is so hard to imagine now <laughs> yeah i mean you look at shenzhen do you imagine passing through shenzhen now even in the last 30 40 years how much it's changed like from farmland um you know back then i mean when you were a kid that must have been something else well like like i told you like you know i couldn't even walk after a movie yeah back then so you were fairly young then, and then throughout the rest of your childhood or kind of teens, would you go to China also, or not so much during those time periods? Not so much, you know, during my teens. But after 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 coming back here, like you know, while living in Hong Kong, you know, started working, I I, I traveled quite a bit to to China. Yes, that was um, that was uh, before ninety seven. Yep. Okay, so that must have been, I mean, it, it sounds like it could have been a similar situation to you, uh, to, to my friend I was speaking about where you uh, had a chance to see from a child to that period of time how much it changed. Yep. And you imagine that momentum continuing, you probably, you know, say this is a pretty good country to be. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong's success, even pre-handover, had a lot to do with it being a door to China, didn't it? Yep. Um, and so uh, if, if you were to look at it from that point of view, it makes sense that, you know, obviously there's going to be a, um, an inevitable tie. Um, but I, I like the story of what you did um, during handover. Oh, that, that day, it was raining cats and dogs. On the handover day? No, the day after. I, I think the day after the hangover. Oh, it was the day after handover. You went, you, you, you went and yeah. you, you crossed over to, uh, to Shenzhen. Yeah. And do you remember what you told me you said when you, when you re reached the border? Yeah, I reached the border. Like, you know, I, I, I told the immigration officer that I'm home. Yeah, yeah. He said, open up. I'm home, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're the same people now. But that was, that was because, like, you know, comparing the two, two experiences, like, you know, from uh, my, my childhood, when you know the first time I, I I came back, yeah. That that was really an impression on me. So it it, it left an impression on you uh, when you were a kid, and then also the um, seeing the rate of change yeah. uh, uh, had a, had a piece to do with it also. Yeah. Did you have many friends that were kind of um, at odds with your perspective and your um, you know being proud of China? Um, or you didn't really talk about that with your with your friends. No, the um, the only thing is like you know when I, the place, the Hong Kong that I was growing up, that 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 I was growing up. Well, the last thing that we're interested in is politics. Mm. There was never really an opportunity. Uh, also, though, right? No, there yeah. wasn't any opportunity or anything. But you know, the last thing that we we were interested in is politics. Yeah. Okay, we cared about freedom. We we cared about the, the the rule of law. So there must have been people that thought in your circle that uh, the handover meant potentially a threat to that, that there would be a threat to the rule of law, that there would be a threat because from their perception, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Hong Kongers who are kind of uh, more uh, on the anti-China side, 
they really like to identify with their British kind of, you know, aware, you know, our British influence, right? Um, and I had some interesting experiences in Macau because in Macau, you know, they're a little bit more laid back. And I was speaking to somebody, she's in her early 30s. Um, she owns a restaurant in Macau. And she was saying that definitely it does play a role that it was the British that were in charge of Hong Kong and the Portuguese in, in Macau to explain some of the differences in the, the way that they look at things. Because the Portuguese oh, yeah. are more laid back. They're like, ah, yeah. oh, whatever. She said, it's not that Portuguese are not arrogant. They can be arrogant, yeah. but they're not really that. Um, I can't remember the word she used, but there's a special characteristic that comes with the, the, the British kind of uh, element. But in that regard, to get back to my uh, point, um, there must have been a lot of people that thought, because you said you care about freedom, uh, you care about rule of law. There must have been a lot of people that thought that it would it would end or it would start to erode after uh, ninety seven, maybe in your circle of friends. And you uh, you didn't really uh, agree with that, but did you have a lot of friends like that that were just kind yeah, of? Yeah, of course. Yeah, but then, like you know what we we never c cared about like you no know, politics so much. But yeah, that, so that's fine though. But, but your friends, we, we, you know, most people, we, we just want a decent life, right? We just want a decent life. You know, well, go to work. You know, have a, have a good job, have a good job. You know, a decent earnings, you know, a decent income. You know, raise a family, lead a happy life. That's all. Right. In in that regard, um, I'm. Oops. I just <laughs> I just I just cheers with my microphone here in that regard um, was there also a, a, a fear in terms of that that um, now um, China was being handed back to this or sorry Hong Kong was being handed back to this um, what some may have seen as a backward country where those things would be under threat freedom rule of law ability to make an earning um, did you ever did you ever get into like debates with your friends or anything like that or you just kind of I try to avoid it you, you try to avoid it yeah. I try to avoid as much as possible like, you know I, I try to stay away from these debates right okay I don't even get myself on uh, you know onto the um uh, uh, you know the social media right okay I stayed away from that as much as possible you know th this is a, this is a common thing I hear from so many Hong Kongers who are pro China and it's almost like it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a pity because all you hear are these people on the other side who are saying who are more anti-China because the people who are pro-China they're not willing to speak out. There's obviously the, the additional element um, with the with the current kind of situation that people who are a little bit too pro um, uh, pro establishment or pro Beijing whatever you want to call it in Hong Kong um, they're under risk when they say that uh, with the you know attacks on shops and attack uh, you know arson attacks and things like that um, but even the people outside of Hong Kong who don't have that risk they're like you they're just like I don't want to get involved in it um, you know I've I don't know if it's just because it's like I've got better things to do with my life or I, I don't want to you know it or is it is it also it would be useless you feel like it would be useless to try to explain it to them no because like you know hong kong the characteristics the characteristics of of the old hong kong people you know is that like you know what we we don't care about politics we care about freedom we care about you know the quality of life and that's why the joint declaration guarantees 50 years and change on the lifestyle of Hong Kong and the system of Hong Kong. Right. The system of Hong Kong unchanged and the lifestyle of Hong Kong unchanged. Okay. Horse races and dances. <laughs> okay. Horse races and, and, and dance. Entertainment, enjoying Entertainment life. Entertainment and enjoy life, like, you know, 50 years unchanged. Do you, do you feel like, um, I, I don't want to get too much in pol into politics, but um, do you feel like there, uh, there's a, a, a chance that there's a, a, they're conflating two separate issues here where a, a lot of the unrest has to do more with um, a reduced upward momentum in Hong Kong, the uh, affordability problems with houses. You know, for a young person growing up in Hong Kong, I, I, it must be so hard to imagine being able to afford a home in Hong Kong at this point. And even though a lot of that comes from the mechanisms that uh, were put in place before handover, you know, selling all of these lands to big kind of uh, groups and basically having these monopolies on multiple kinds of businesses, that that's, that's the issue. But um, they instead blame the current system 
and they're making some mistakes in that sense where because those things are the, the, the things that you're talking about enjoying life uh, uh, earning a good living and stuff like that those things are difficult in Hong Kong now but it's not really uh, it, it, it's actually a product of doing exactly what you said not changing the system that's part of the problem is that they kept the system that allowed for this kind of a just handful of people who are controlling everything do you know what I'm saying like is there apartments like you know well houses has always been expensive in Hong Kong even 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 back then yeah before and after you know e even before before the hangover nothing to do with nothing to do with the you know hangover or whatsoever like you know it has been has been all has always been expensive in Hong Kong oh, housing really? really has always been expensive like you know well we we, we have to look at like you know where do they get the tax Okay, we, we, we don't, the government doesn't have any, any, any other, almost n no other income, source of income, other than, you know, from selling land. L land sales. Land sales, like, you know, well, well, what can you complain about? Like, you know, well, free, almost free medical. Yeah. Free education. Very good in infrastructure. Yeah, they, I mean, they have the public housing system also, right? Um, uh, I think more people, more people living in public housing than 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 in the private sector. I, I have a friend um, who has an interesting take on that. Where um, so he's a business guy in Hong Kong, and say, same kind of thing. He can't speak up about his perspectives on Hong Kong because um, they're not very friendly to the movement that's going on on the ground there right now. Um, and he's a, a fairly public figure. He's on. Um, I'll tell you after the cameras are not rolling who they are, who he is. Um, but he was saying that. Uh, uh, when the public housing system was created under the British, there was a situation where it was designed to really benefit um, big business. Where, you know, because back then you, st you still had factories, you still had some of these things going on in Hong Kong. And by creating public housing uh, systems, the, it, it re relieved the pressure on these big companies and these factories to increase the salary. They no longer have to increase the salary. So basically all the government was doing was b making subsidized dormitories for these um, uh, these companies and it created a little bit of the uh, the, the, the problem uh, the same problem we're facing but I think it's undeniable even though uh, Hong Kong's a good place in terms of like you said medical care education uh, the property the property issue is a serious issue yeah, it is it is it's a serious issue in Hong it, Kong it is a serious issue but like you know at the same time like you know this how the earnings how, how the earnings gen is being generated yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a free port. There's no import duties. There's if you talk about like you know, well, the life, the life, how how bad the life is in Hong Kong. But you know, I see a lot of youngsters traveling, traveling overseas. You know, every now and then I see you know a lot of youngsters. Every now and then they go to Japan. A lot of Hong Kongers go to Japan. Yeah, they love they love Japan. You know, having 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 had all those experiences, like you know, the experience of comparing con compared contrast the two crossing border and uh, you know what I saw in, in back in, in, in the old days in, in Shenzhen getting mosquito bites <laughs> and uh, seeing Shenzhen as it is today why should I worry about like you know the lifestyle of Hong Kong being taken taken away yeah I mean there, there is so much opportunity on this side also for um, I think it, it, it almost seems like um, obviously uh, I think people overestimate how much Beijing can do in Hong Kong to fix these issues. Uh, the, part of the problem is, is because they have this framework that they can't interfere too much. So the only thing they can do in absence of that is create opportunities for Hong Kongers on this side as well. So you've got obviously the Greater Bay Area Project, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, free schooling for that Hong Kongers can come over and their kids can go to school in the Shenzhen, no problem. Kids from Dongguan can't even come over. The next city over can't even come here to... No, the, to the, the point I'm driving at is like, you know, well, if Hong Kong people are being afraid of getting the, 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 the lifestyle taken away, taken away by, by the mainland, well, they, they just have to. All they have to do is just cross the border and have a look of Shenzhen. That is a big thing, isn't it? It's just having a look because with my friend, that's what it took, was coming over and saying, oh, hold on a second. There's a lot going on here. I mean, especially with what... Uh, They're afraid of, like, the world. I mean, you know, Hong Kong being toned down by, by, by the Chinese, by the Chinese government or the central government. Right. 
okay all, all all they need to do is just cross the border and have a look at Shenzhen yeah I mean and compare it, 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 and compare it with some old pictures like you know what from 30 years ago yeah seriously I, I mean even even if they didn't cross over this whole uh, kind of pandemic situation that we're going through right now and and seeing the difference in um, the ability for the government to respond to something like this even that itself should be enough to say okay hold on a second but people are so convinced that nothing good can come from here that they don't even they don't even look at how our lives are getting back to normal here while you know overseas they're they're not, they're not able to they're they're i mean there are some countries that are obviously doing a good job job but if you compare it to countries like america i mean the, the response difference is huge and that should be enough to ask get people to ask questions okay well let, let's see what what can this government accomplish and like you said about enjoying life and affordability uh, or um, um, upward momentum and things like that, how much better can it get than what the government has done here in terms of how many people they've raised out of poverty, the standard of living, how it's improved in this short period of time? It seems like nobody, anybody who has negative ideas about China, they don't have a threshold where if you pass that threshold where they say, okay, if they make these numbers of accomplishments, I will suddenly say, maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's, you know, they don't have a threshold. They can keep going and going and going and going. They can become the number one economy in the world and people are still going to be saying they're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So in some ways, maybe you guys have the right idea. You guys who are from Hong Kong, who have a different idea on things, you're just not wasting your breath. It's like even if you spoke up and even if you said, hold, hold on a second, guys. It's like, what's the use? Nobody's ready to listen. I'm doing it, though. I'm doing it. You know, I, I, I'm the one who's stupid here. I'm the one who's going out and I'm, I'm, uh, I've, I've been designated a, a high-level wumao by, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> by the foreign community or the Hong Kong community. But I do feel like it's just the disconnect between reality and the perception that people have. That's, uh, there's an, an English, an English word for it. I get inarticulated inarticulated yeah <laughs> okay Wu you i mean I, I know i know some i, I know some of the uh, younger hong kongers um who are i mean you know francis you met francis right um and um he's over here doing kind of just an ordinary job and uh, well actually no he's he's uh, he's opened up his own place now his own uh, restaurant and um he he, he he gets it he doesn't really go out there to try to oh francis like you know the chef yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. and he's a young guy He's a young, young, guy. young man. He speaks German. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He studied in Germany for a bit, and um, he's no the the he study he study in uh, in Germany and the U.S. Oh, okay, you know better than he was my staff, and you know better than me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, but I don't see him really. He doesn't get political, also. So it's actually not, it, I, don't, I don't think it is an older generation thing where you're talking about the older generation, they just, they're like, okay, whatever, you know. Uh, uh, he also doesn't do it. He understands that there's so much potential here. He's living over here in Shenzhen, but he's not going to stand up and speak, uh, speak about it. He's not going to say, guys, you've got China all wrong. He's just like, whatever, I've got things to do. It is still unfortunate though, because it creates an, an uneven uh, narrative uh, 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 or, um, uh, you know, conversation that's going on out there and uh, it frustrates me so that's why I, I i'm doing something about it at least so you know i'm doing what you should be doing <laughs> but you've got better things to do than me so <laughs> yeah exactly i gotta get a little bit of a refill here but yeah i mean so now anyways you're 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 here um and um you've obviously got a family here now and this is where you're going to be. I mean, you don't see yourself leaving any anytime soon now, right? No, there's there, there's a, you know, the Chinese word, the Chinese word. How how do you say, um, well, sifan, right? You, you know what sifan is? Yeah. To to eat. Right. Well, why would you say like you know, fan, not not eat meat, not eat eat meat? Good question. Even in the north, they don't say that where they do eat more noodles. You know, why don't they call it noodles? You know how 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 to write the word fun. 
with one side eat and the other side fun. You eat, but no fun. Okay, you 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 join the riot、mm-hmm. or you go to the riot when you're starving. Okay, it's fun, fun. Okay, on one side, on 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 the left side, on the left hand side of of the of the character is eat, and the other side is riot. 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 Or eat and riot. <laughs> okay, combine as a word. Was that sit fun? Okay, 有吃不造反 Right. With 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 the eating, with the eating side, we don't go riot. Without、right. without the eating side, without the eating side, ah,、uh, we go riot. Yeah, that that reminds me of a, a quote too, where、um, so, 农民农民从来都是没饭吃才造反的 Yeah. It reminds me of a quote that、um, somebody wrote.、Uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but they were said,、um, "I'm going to support the revolution that puts food on my table." And、um, you know, when what, what, I mean here, like every everybody outside has this idea that people are, you know, dying for a revolution here, and it's like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, and so your your example of that word is a is a good way to help illustrate that as well. Yeah. See, like you know what, I I got nothing to complain. Yeah, it, it's it, it it. I think people are there. There must be people who are starting to recognize this because I remember seeing、um, someone. I I can't remember who it was, but I follow a lot of people who are kind of more on the anti-China side too to see what is their argument. Why why are they this way? And、um, after the the handling of this pandemic here in China, after it was done so well, it looked like this person became really frustrated. And he said, "You know," he said, "the the Chinese people really need to."、Uh, I can't remember the words he used. He said they need to、uh, have a almost like have a recession. They need to all of a sudden not have the lifestyle that they've suddenly gotten used to anymore. So that,、uh, so that then they start asking questions and saying, "Why is that?" You know, they they, they were hoping that this pandemic would be an opportunity for.、Um, Economic issues in China, so that Chinese people would start questioning the government. But it's like, why don't you flip that around? Why don't you ask yourself? They've not been given this opportunity. The government's not giving this this opportunity, and they're not upset. So when are you going to say, "Well, hold on a second. Maybe they're doing a good job for their people." And、um, I guess it goes back to the same point that I was talking about. There's sometimes it just what's the point in saying anything? Because if you can do mental gymnastics to that level, to still say. We need to overthrow this government somehow. All of a sudden, it's not really about what's best for the people in China anymore. So, do you do you、um, do you still have any friends now in Hong Kong, or acquaintances, or people that you grew up with? That because obviously Hong Kong has become very polarized right now, right? Yeah, it is.、Um, do you have people that have been pushed far in the opposite direction, where they're the opposite of you, and they're?、Um, Really gone to this whole more anti-China kind of stance. I don't know if you can、uh, label me as a、uh, being, you know,、uh, being being one end of、uh, of the two polars. Okay. I perceive it that way because you're <laughs> you 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 just just because I'm not complaining. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, I would label you, and I, 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 throughout this interview, I've almost labeled you as. Being pro-China, but it's like it's just being pro-common sense at the end of the day, isn't it? In terms of just saying, I mean, they're you know they're doing a good job, and if they're you know I can shu fan, shu fan, yeah, hu jiu, yeah. That's it. That's that's an interesting way to put it. Is that you're not really pro-China, you're not anti-China, but you're not pro-China. You're just these are the facts. Yep, I'm not interested in politics whatsoever. Right. That's a characteristic of the Hong Kong people. Or well, or, before, or, yeah. yeah, not yeah. anymore. Of <laughs> my generation, <laughs> yeah, of my generation. Right. We're kind of like you no know, more interested in,、uh, you know, leading, leading a better life, living living a better life, like you know, leading a leading a family. It's almost you get to the point where you just say. 
Uh, guys, if you don't want to take, take advantage of this, if you don't want to see um, what's wrong about your stance, then you know, suit yourself. That's your loss. Suit yourself. I still just kind of feel like, though, when it gets to the point where it gets so ridiculous, and that because there hasn't been this pushback from people who um, kind of understand the situation a little bit better, and it gets to the point where people are saying, the Chinese people need saving. You know, they need us to come and... Yeah, that's the look. That's the look. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, especially when you have countries, um, when you look at how this pandemic is being handled, saying that, saying we are the, the, the measure of, you know, success. It's like, uh, you know, hold on a second. Somebody just needs to... It's gotten to a point where it's so obvious that I feel like if I say just a few basic things that people will realize I'll be like, okay, hold on a second. I think we're being a little bit silly here. But even with how obvious it's become, it still doesn't seem to it still doesn't seem to happen. So maybe it is maybe it is futile. No, I I think it's gonna end up end up looking pretty funny. You know, well me in this in this interview, like you know, not having much to say. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I mean I I, I, I am um I keep trying to carefully push you towards uh, a little, because I get political in a lot of my content. I'm kind of carefully pushing you towards that direction, but you're not biting. You're just saying, no. <laughs> but let, so on that, on that uh, note, talking about just the facts, in terms of, uh, so obviously we've just come through a really tough time with the pandemic and we, yeah. we've had a, basically a, 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 a total shutdown. What are, what are your impressions on it? Because you were here, like me, you I were didn't, the whole time. I didn't leave my building, my apartment building, for, for a period of 50, 50 days. 50 days, yeah. 50 days. Okay, I did not leave the building. Not even to the, to, you know, to the, to, the, to the garden, to the public area. I did not leave my, 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 my building for 50 days. Yeah, and you, you, that, that is... Um, there was such a level of cooperation here too, where it was like, you know, because technically we could go to the supermarkets. We were allowed to go to the supermarkets yeah. and stuff like that, but most people did that. They said, no, we're, I mean, we've got delivery services available and stuff like that, right? Um, but there was a level of cooperation that you don't see uh, overseas where they're saying, don't take away my freedoms. You can't tell me to wear a mask. You can't tell me I can't go to the beach. Um, it, it seems like it's a little bit less individualistic here where they consider the group or they say, this is just what we need to do. It's not only from a personal safety point of view saying, okay, I'm going to stay inside to protect myself, but they know that this is what we've got to do. And um, it was just amazing to see people come together like that. I mean, also in Wuhan, you also saw kind of villagers coming and donating their vegetables and things like that. Like people really, really came together when it really matters right now, like during a time like this. It was really amazing. It's about survival. A sense of survival. You had a you had an interesting story when you actually when you came back to this office also like how serious they were taking things here. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I I was actually um, speaking to my cousin uh, today this morning, and she was talking about how confirmed COVID patients, like she has some uh, she has some family there, confirmed COVID patients are told to go and uh, self isolate at home. Nobody's checking up on them to see if they're leaving the house or not. Nobody's uh, contact tracing who else they were in contact with. And it's an absolute, I don't, uh, I'm not, I don't want to swear, <laughs> but you know what it is. It, it's an absolute what. And um, here it was completely different. I mean, even when you try to come here to your office, you had an interesting story when you come in and what, what happened? Uh, you had the security that came up yeah. and said, what are you doing here? Yeah. You know? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Like, you know, well, uh, do, do you have any 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 papers on anything and uh immediately immediately like you know five you know within f three to five minutes like you know i i, I came into the office like you know the um the officers came yeah and check on the papers and check on the papers and 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 all those disinfectants right yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, even today, even after we're kind of getting back to normal, um, yeah. obviously, um, Declan's gone back to school yesterday, my, my son. Even, even today, I still have to show my QR code downstairs when I come in to mm -hmm. see where I, where I came from. Oh, yeah, um, because, like, you know, you are on 
Well, You're well, alien. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they, they, that's, that's, that's a little bit ridiculous because at this point they need to realize that foreigners haven't been allowed into China if they're not already in China for a long time. But they're uh -huh. still, they're like, we know what's going on overseas. And, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. <laughs> my face is my QR code right now. Where they're like, oh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, people really came together um, in, in such an amazing way. But uh, as I was saying, in, in, in the U.S. with my family, I'm, we have multiple family members who have been confirmed. Um, and my, my, uh, my aunt, um, I think I'm going to be doing a, the video. She agreed to do a video with me to talk about her experiences. It's just unbelievable. Like um, even when she uh, called the ambulance for, um, to, uh, to, to pick her up because she was feeling really sick. Um, she thought it was her vertigo at first. And, uh, in New York? Uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. And uh, the, uh, the, when the ambulance arrived, they didn't come up with a stretcher. They didn't go to her apartment with a stretcher. She had to walk to the ambulance. And when she got to the ambulance, they said, um, it is, uh, don't lie down on the bed. It's too dirty. Yep. And then they told her she had to sit on the steel bench. And when she couldn't sit up anymore because she was too weak and she laid down sideways on the steel bench, they yelled at her and they said, don't do that. You're not allowed to do that. Sit up. That's that's a that's the number one, you know, economy in the world. This is this is how it's it's unbelievable. I mean, there's so much more. I don't know. I don't know how much I can say yet. Um, I, I mean, there's a chance that I might upload that uh, podcast before Blimey. I do this one. But it, it was it was just uh, I, 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 there's so much more to the story, and I got ch I had chills this morning when I was hearing it. I had chills. I couldn't believe it. And. Um, I'm just at this point, I'm really thankful for being here, for being, you know, and, and, and I'm just really worrying about my family overseas at this point. And when you get to that point and people outside are still not realizing, they're saying, OK, they've got a pretty effective system here. They've got a pretty effective government. If you can't convince them after something like this, I don't think there's any there's any hope, really. <laughs> I think I think pretty much. You'll get in, in articulated like like I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speechless, just speechless. I I do have to say though, there are some people who there's a very few number of people who come around. They're saying, you know what? Actually, there is something here, but it's such a small percentage of people who are willing to kind of um, take a step back. I I I, I had um, I don't I don't usually engage uh, with a lot of um, kind of trolls or people who look like they're beyond hope. But once in a while I do, like maybe once every two months or something like that, I'll go on a rampage and I'll start interacting with these people. And then it's like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of quiz them on their understanding of China um, and, you know, w w whether it be about it, past politics, history and stuff like that. And they'll ask me questions, too. Uh, they'll ask me questions, too, and I will I'll answer them. But. I, I probe a little bit deeper about their understanding of certain situations before we kind of debate those topics in detail. And after three, four, five times I say, well, actually you're wrong, and I provide the, uh, the evidence, I, I get to a point where I ask them, I say, okay, so you have such strong um, anti-China kind of ideas, and I've shown you three, four, five instances where you are completely wrong about your perception um, or, or your understanding of China. Have you, have you gotten to a point where you're going to step back and say, okay, well, maybe I should take, uh, you know, a, a wider look at this, or maybe I should reconsider my thoughts. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen, but it's an interesting experience because you are, uh, what's the word you use, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 I, I use the word speechless, but the British word that you, uh, Inarticulated. Inarticulated. Yeah, I like that one better. <laughs> you just inarticulated by the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, cheers. Cheers. To speechless. To speechlessness. Yeah. That's a good. Uh, that's a good brand name. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm thinking of uh, after the. Um, th there's a, a Hong Kong protester group with uh, like seventeen thousand subscribers, and they designated me a high level Wu Mao. Um, I'm actually planning on making a um, a beer, a special beer, which is called uh, High Level Wu Mao. <laughs> 
and it's going to be served exclusively in uh, those cups with uh, Mao Zedong on it. <laughs> <laughs> those teacups. <laughs> but speechless is a really good name for uh, for a follow up beer. <laughs> So uh, to wrap this up, um, in terms of um, where you're at now, um, so obviously things are starting to get back back to normal here yep. a little bit. Um, business is uh, it's still gonna, I think it's still going to take a little while for business to really pick up. Uh, there, there, there are there are I mean, there's no denying there are some people struggling, yeah. um, and uh, it's it's going to take um, a little while to recover, but. You're still kind of continuing with the wine, and it's, you're starting to see things slowly pick up again. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I got my hair cut uh, yesterday, and I saw the place was full, and it's starting to kind of get back to normal. So it is, it is encouraging, but there's, it, it, it's going to be quite a, a difficult period for the world, the global economy in the short term, isn't it? Well, we have to eat. Yep. We have to we drink. Have to, we have to chifan. We have to chifan. We, yep. have, we have to hejo. <laughs> So life pretty much will get back to normal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it will eventually. We'll get there. Yeah. So, well, with that in mind, let's wrap it up there, and um, we will continue finishing our our yep. bottle of wine. Yeah. But uh, until next time, guys, I hope you enjoyed the chat and you enjoyed meeting my good friend Eric, and um, we we hope you're all keeping safe as well, of course. And we'll see you in the next podcast. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.